Welcome to Decode, I'm Kellen Mace. This is video two in a two-part series on working with Gutenberg blocks in headless WordPress projects. In the first video, we saw one approach for doing that, which involved rendering Gutenberg blocks as HTML in our decoupled front-end JavaScript app. In this video, we'll see an alternative approach. Uh, this one will use the WP GraphQL Gutenberg extension and use that to allow us to uh, query for structured JSON data about all of our blocks, and then use that data to render them to the page. In the first video, I talked about how WordPress currently does not have a complete server-side registry of Gutenberg blocks. For that reason, it's not currently possible to fire off a request from your JavaScript front-end app to your WordPress backend and get all of the data for all of your blocks for a given post. Uh, that is what the WP GraphQL Gutenberg plugin gives you. Uh, it employs kind of a workaround to achieve a server-side registry of blocks that you can then query against. Let's take a second to understand how this extension works at a high level. So in the WordPress admin, when the Gutenberg block editor boots up that JavaScript application, it takes uh, the blocks that have been defined in JavaScript and builds an uh, in-memory array, uh, which is a blocks registry of all the blocks that exist and all the details about them. The WP GraphQL Gutenberg plugin then takes that uh, complete blocks registry and sends it in a network request to the WordPress backend and saves it to the database there. In addition, it uh, adds those blocks to the WP GraphQL schema. So the end result is that you have a uh, complete server-side registry of blocks and all of the attributes um, on those blocks that you can query for from your front-end JavaScript app. This server-side registry of blocks that's been built up gets updated anytime a user opens the Gutenberg JavaScript app to keep it up to date. Uh, opening it one time though for one post uh, sometimes isn't quite enough for existing sites just because uh, different um, posts or different post types can have different blocks associated with them. So to get a, a full registry um, saved on the server, it's necessary to open up Gutenberg for every single uh, post. So for that reason, this extension uh, comes with an options page uh, with a button you can click. And what it'll do is cycle through all of the posts on the site and open uh, a hidden iframe where it loads up Gutenberg and then saves the block registry for that post. It's not the most ideal situation, but it does the trick for updating that server-side registry of blocks. Next, let's see how we can make use of the data that this extension provides in a real front-end Next.js application. You can see here that I have a local WordPress site running and I have the WP GraphQL and WP GraphQL Gutenberg plugins installed and activated. I'm now able to go to the GraphQL Gutenberg options page and click the update button. This, as I mentioned, will loop through my posts, opening each in a hidden iframe and loading up Gutenberg and then grabbing the blocks registry and saving that to the database to make sure it has a full picture of all the types of blocks that exist. Once the registry has been updated, let's head over to GraphQL and then graphical IDE. So before activating this extension, you only would have been able to query for a post's content like this. So you can see I'm querying for post 45 and getting the title and the content. So since we have this extension installed, we're able to instead query for blocks. So I'll paste in uh, this query that I built up here. And you can see that we're grabbing the title still, but now instead of content, we're getting blocks. And then for all blocks, regardless of their type, we're getting uh, the name right there. But then for a few types of blocks, we're drilling down and saying uh, for headings, these are uh, exactly the attributes that I want about those blocks. Likewise, for paragraphs, uh, these are the exact attributes I want back. So with that in place, now I can execute this and watch the difference here. So you can see what I get back is structured JSON data. So this uh, first block in the array represents a heading. So this is an H2 uh, in my case. So the name of it, you can see it's a core heading block. Uh, the level is two, meaning it's an H2. And then I have the content that should go inside uh, of this heading. Next one is a core paragraph block. You can see all the attributes I get there, including the content that goes inside of that paragraph and so on. Next, let's see how we can make use of this structured blocks data in a front-end Next.js app. 
uh, I'll head over here to my GitHub. You can see I have this repo, WP GraphQL Gutenberg demo. So if you'd like, you can clone that down and then follow along as we walk through this. So I have the site running uh, locally here on localhost 3000, and I also have the code open in a code editor. So I'll go ahead and click through to one of my posts. We'll go to uh, test post one, for example. And here we are, we have our title and content. Now let's see uh, the code that's powering this now. So in my code editor, I'll go to pages and then this URI catch all route here, and we'll see how we're doing this. So I'm using the get static props function that Next.js provides. And then inside of that, I'm getting the URI for the current page that the user is on here, this test post. And then I'm using that to fire off this get post GraphQL query here. So you can see um, it's getting a post by its ID. And then on that post, we're getting a title. And here um, I have a fragment where I'm, I'm spreading into this um, all of the other fields. So we'll take a look at that fragment uh, in a moment. But for now, just know that we're you know, querying to get all of the blocks data here. And ultimately, uh, that, that post is passed through as a prop to this component here, our single post component. This component then uh, receives that post data and then destructures that. So it's able to pull out the title of the block and then the blocks array as well. Inside the component, um, we check if we have blocks. And if we do, then we go ahead and map over each of the blocks. And for each one of those, we render this block component. So let's keep following this trail now and see this block component. So I'll go to components and then block here. And I'll skip the GraphQL fragment for now and just scroll down to the component. So this component is little more than a switch statement. You can see it just uh, grabs the block prop and destructures that to pull out a few things, and then it runs a switch on the name of the block. And here, I only have two that are not commented out, uh, the two that we're currently supporting. So if it's a core heading block, then we're rendering this heading block component and passing the attributes through. Otherwise, if it's a core paragraph block, then we're rendering uh, this other um, block here, paragraph block. Otherwise, um, if the name of the block wasn't found here, then we just uh, return null to render nothing for it. So at this point in your project, you would need to uh, add support for each type of block and then have a React component um, that's responsible for rendering that block's content. For now, uh, let's keep following this trail and I'll click through to the paragraph block component so we can see what that looks like. So here is paragraph block. Um, you can see that it uh, just destructures the attributes that we care about for paragraphs and that returns a paragraph, as you might have guessed. Um, so we have a little helper function just to figure out what classes it should get there. And then ultimately we're rendering the content. So this is great. Uh, we've been able to query for our blocks data and then iterate through those blocks and for each of them, render a component for the supported blocks that we have like heading and paragraph. So this is good. Um, one thing is broken about this page though, and it's this internal link here. So you can see if I hover over this, it's actually pointing to our uh, headless WordPress backend, which is not what we want uh, for a decoupled site. We want it to point to whatever the front end domain is, of course. So if I were to click through to that, I'm sent to the wrong place. So to fix this, we can use this plugin. Uh, on my GitHub, I have a headless block parser plugin, and you can just follow the steps here if you'd like to use this in your project. Um, but it's pretty simple. What this does is it extends the WP block parser class that WordPress provides, and it just does one extra thing. And that is it replaces the site URLs for um, anchor tags with the domain of our front end decoupled JavaScript app. So you can see here after getting the site URL and the front end app URL, it just runs a simple string replace to swap one out with the other. It also tacks on uh, this data attribute, which we'll see in just a second why that's relevant. Um, so after replacing those, it then calls the regular old parse method that WordPress uses and everything downstream from there uh, in terms of blocks rendering happens as it normally would. So let's see what happens when we activate this plugin. In my WordPress admin, I'll go to plugins and then find headless block parser. And now with that activated, we'll head over to our 
front end app and I'll hover over this link. And sure enough, in the corner there, you can see localhost 3000. So now if our users click on this, it'll shoot them over to test post one. Next, let's talk about how we're rendering this markup that's inside of the content of our individual blocks. I'll head back over here to the WordPress admin and you can see what I mean. So although we're uh, querying for blocks and we're able to get this structured JSON data back, we do still have some markup to deal with inside of the content. So if I scroll down a bit, we'll see an example. Like here, we have a core paragraph block, but you can see that inside of the content for this paragraph, right here, uh, we have an anchor tag. So we have to uh, figure out how we're gonna render that in our front end JavaScript app. One way to achieve that would be to use the dangerously set inner HTML escape hatch uh, that React provides for just rendering arbitrary markup. Um, in our case though, we're gonna do some, something a bit different and use a JavaScript based HTML parser that'll give us one additional benefit. So the library that's used in this project is this one, HTML React Parser. This is a React specific parser, and this is what it does. It says, uh, the parser converts an HTML string to one or more React elements. To replace an element with another element, check out the replace option, which we'll make use of in, in one place. So with that knowledge, um, we'll head back to our code base and see how we're uh, using this. So we get the content for uh, this for this paragraph, and then we're passing it through this parse HTML function that um, uses this parser behind the scenes. Let's see what it would look like if we didn't use that. So I'll just remove uh, this function call momentarily, like that. And now if I save this file, so you can see what's happening here. Um, all of this HTML is being escaped and just rendered to the page just like this, rather than it actually being a clickable link. So to fix that, what we're choosing to do is um, run our content through this parse HTML function that we've created. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So I'll go to lib and then parser. So that library uh, was installed, the HTML React parser, and we're pulling out of that two things, parse and then DOM to React. And then below, we've just created our own function called parse HTML. So it expects a string of HTML here, and it passes that into the parse function that this library provides. But not only that, it also provides uh, this options object that's defined above, and we're using the replace option. Here, we're converting internal links to Next.js link components. How this works is as each HTML element is parsed, it gets passed in here to this replace callback function. And in here, we're checking to see if it's an internal link we're doing it this way. We're checking to see if the name of it is equal to A, meaning it's an anchor tag, and also if in the attributes for this element, we have a data internal link attribute that is set to true. So if that's true, then you can see what we're doing. We're returning a Next.js link component. I can now head over here to my Next.js app and try out an internal link. So I'll click and click again. And as you can see, I'm being sent from one to the other with no full page reload. So in this example, we were making use of this parser to swap out regular old anchor tags with link components for our internal links, uh, but you could use this for a number of other things as well. Next, let's take a look at how we're composing our GraphQL queries. So here in the paragraph block file, I'll scroll up a bit and we can take a look at this fragment here. So you can see that inside, I'm defining all the attributes that we want back for paragraph blocks. And then if you scroll down, you'll notice that this list here that we're destructuring from the props passed into our paragraph block in component match that. Uh, so the reason we're doing, uh, doing this is for code co-location. This makes it really easy to match the two up. So if I you know, want to add or remove one of the props here, I can then you know, head above and add or remove something from this fragment, knowing that you know, all of the data specified in the fragment is ultimately what my component will receive at the end of the day. Um, so breaking um, up the query into a fragment like this uh, makes it nice and easy to manage things. You can see that when we just destructure the props here, we're not actually making use of all of them at the moment. We only are using align and content, um, but in your project, you know, you may, may very well need to use um, several of those. Now let's head to the top of this file and see where this paragraph block attributes uh, fragment is being used. So to do that, we'll go up one level to our block component, and we'll see here that we have this um, blocks field 
fragment that we're building up and inside of uh, the blocks field, this is where we're using those. So we have all of our attributes that heading blocks care about and all of our attributes that paragraph blocks care about. And we're interpolating both of those fragments here into this um, GQL tagged template literal that we're building up. And then we use those in two places. So one place is here. This is where we apply all the heading block attributes. Likewise, down here, this is where we apply all the paragraph ones. And I have a little to-do here in a comment that just says, add fragments for all other block types. Uh, so in your project, you could follow a similar pattern to this, where you define the fragment um, that's co-located with you know, the component responsible for rendering it. And then here in the block file, um, you interpolate it like this, and then go ahead and make use of the fragment for that type of block. Now let's go up one final level and see where this blocks field uh, fragment we've built up is used. So if we head back to our um, URI catch-all route here, and I scroll down a bit, this is that original one that we saw at, toward the start of the video here. So this is where we're taking uh, the blocks field, and then we're applying that at this level, so that when we query for our post, we're getting its title, as well as all of the fields specified in that fragment. Let's wrap things up by talking about the trade-off that you're making if you choose to go with this approach for rendering Gutenberg blocks. This approach gives you a ton of control. Um, as we saw, uh, by building up a server-side registry of blocks and then exposing those to the WP GraphQL schema, that allows us in our front-end JavaScript app to query for individual blocks and then even inside of those to specify the exact attributes that we want back for each of those blocks. And we really have full control over exactly how they're rendered. You know, So if we want to um, end up rendering out markup for a certain block that's vastly different than what you know WordPress core would have rendered for that uh, particular block on a you know, traditional WordPress site, we can do that. You can do anything with those attributes that you want, render them however you want. That also applies to styling. Um, you can style you know blocks however you want as well. And you can even easily support blocks that are more complex. So if you have blocks that are interactive in some way and the user, you know, interacts with them and they make their own network requests or they maintain their own internal state, that kind of thing. Um, that's a good use case for uh, this kind of setup where you're able to render separate components that represent each individual block. So all of that fine-grained control, uh, that comes at a cost though. And the cost is ease of implementation uh, is, is kind of out the window. Uh, in the first video of this series, we saw that if you take the, um, the full... Uh, HTML content for the post content and render that to the page, swapping out a couple of the nodes using a parser, um, that you know saves you a fair amount of work because you're using the, the already generated markup that, uh, that WordPress gives you. With this approach, you lose that ease of implementation though. Um, you have to render your own components for every type of block and even keep in mind more complex scenarios like blocks that have other blocks nested inside of them. So you have some recursion going on where you have blocks inside of blocks and your front-end app would need to accommodate all of those. For styling, we also talked about how since you're the one generating all the markup for these blocks, you would also need to style all of them uh, from scratch. In addition, the data fetching uh, scenario gets more complex as well. Instead of simply saying, give me the post content and getting the HTML, um, now you have these more complex queries and fragments uh, that you need to compose to get all the attributes for all of your components. So it's definitely more involved, but again, the trade-off is more fine-grained control. I hope this video gave you a really good sense of what querying for and rendering Gutenberg blocks using the WP GraphQL Gutenberg extension uh, looks like in practice, and it's helpful to you in your projects. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe, and we'll see you in the next video.